We've seen so much interest in our special 23% off offer for our e-course, Discover Your Second Act Significance, that we're continuing it throughout February. The three-module video course will equip you to transform your life from, is this all there is, to this is all I've ever wanted. Each session is led by Beyond the Crucible founder Warwick Fairfax, who shares his own hard-won successes in turning trials into triumphs. And he's got some high-powered help from USA Today's gratitude guru to a runner-up on TV's Project Runway, from a recording artist with a Billboard number one album to a couple of best-selling authors. It's an ensemble of men and women living significant second acts who would command a six-figure price tag if any business wanted to fill an auditorium with them to coach their employees. But we've packed their insights and action steps into our course for a sliver of that cost. And if you act before the end of February, you'll get 23% off your enrollment. Just visit secondactsignificance.com and use the code 23 for 23. So don't delay. Enroll today and remember, life's too short to live a life you don't love. Now, here's today's podcast episode. Welcome, friends, to Beyond the Crucible, the podcast on which we discuss some of life's most devastating, challenging events and circumstances. We call them crucible experiences, and we talk about them to offer hope and healing that as painful as they may be, they are not the end of your story. In fact, they can be the beginning of a new chapter of your story filled with purpose and, yes, with joy. And speaking of new chapters, you've joined us in the midst of our special winter series, Burn the Ships. For the next several weeks, we will be talking with guests who've been brave enough to make dramatic pivots, leaving behind safe and familiar lives to do something dramatic, new, life-changing, and significant, facing down and overcoming crucibles along the way. I'm Gary Schneeberger, the co-host of the show. Our host and guide is Warwick Fairfax, founder of Beyond the Crucible, who has himself set a few figurative ships on fire in pursuit of his vision for a life of significance, which gives him both insights into and compassion for others who've walked a similar path. And Warwick, we have a... Uh, a special guest today who knows all of that stuff to be true, um, and I, I'm I'm really looking forward to this one, and I think you are as well. Absolutely, uh, very much looking forward to it. I'm looking forward to it because our guest today is Darwin Shaw. I'm going to read you Darwin's about info on his LinkedIn page. I'm an actor and filmmaker. He says, very modestly, a former medical doctor, my acting career spans over 15 years, working on projects from Casino Royale to House of Cards. My latest project is the creation of an international anthology of 24 films called The Antiviral Film Project. We have recently wrapped our second chapter. I've written a, a multi-season TV show called The Hydra and an environmental horror feature called The Pulse, both in development. And for me, the, uh, the most special part of having Darwin as a guest is that Darwin and I have been friends for about 10 years now. Uh, we met in Hollywood when I was doing some promotion out there, and we'll talk more about that as the show goes on. But Warwick, take it away. Well, Darwin, thanks so much for being here. Um... You've done a lot of different things from Prince of Persia, Casino Royale, um, uh, Peter in the Bible, uh, Homeland. You've done a lot of different things. Um, so thank you. You know, I'd, I'd love to kind of just start with your upbringing because as I was looking where you grew up in England, I feel like you're about as far north in England as you can get without hitting Scotland. <laughs> I mean, it just seems like it's, you know, I don't know, you're probably Manchester, Liverpool, uh they're all probably south of where you grew up, which is like amazing to me, having gone to college in England. So tell us a bit about your life growing up and uh, in Northern England. And yeah, you've got a, a fascinating background. So just yeah, tell us a bit about life for you. What was it like? Yeah, well, I grew up in in Leeds, which is not too much further north than uh, the Manchester, um, but it's a, a big northern, originally a, a big industrial town um, of around a million people. But my grandfather was a parish priest 
um, in a very small village. And literally that was, you know, 20 miles from the Scottish border. Um, and I was born in in a little hospital in a very, very small town called Brampton, um, whilst my dad was studying and my mum was staying with uh, with my grandparents. So I have this kind of a very different uh, two worlds I was in, really. One was this sort of rural idyll um, in the countryside, uh, in this very sort of, in a world of, I don't know, I don't know if it really exists anymore, but a very, a very small community, um, you know, with a, with one shop and uh, you know a little church and uh, <laughs> you know you had to drive you know fifteen miles to get to the nearest city, um, but then my my main life was in in Leeds, which was a much more of a uh, you know cosmopolitan but quite you know quite brash uh, <laughs> brash town in the seventies, which was uh, you know it had its own challenges as well. Yeah. And so you have an interesting background. I think from what I understand that your um, uh, mother was English, but your father had, you know, this different heritage from, I guess, grandparents to Kashmir and Afghanistan. Kashmir is, listeners, I guess it's in India, but uh, Pakistan and India have been, um, you know, fighting over who owns Kashmir and all of that. So you, so talk about just some of the various elements because I'm sure that gives you a diversity of perspective. Uh, yeah, that, maybe not, that not everybody you grew up with maybe had, which I think is is, is fascinating. No, I, I mean I didn't meet another mixed race person until I went to university. Um, mm. So I spent the whole of my childhood in a in a place where. There were people um, from other countries. Obviously, England has a, a very broad history and rich history of of immigration, um, but there wasn't anybody else who was Pakistani English like myself. Um, or I think there maybe was one other mixed person I, I met, but I did, probably didn't even realise they were. You know, um, and it was a pretty racist uh, time in in history, and you know we had some pretty rough experiences growing up. Um, but my dad was born in India. And at that point, India didn't exist. Uh, Pakistan didn't exist. It was all one country. Um, and it was when he, he was young, when he was a, you know, a very small child, that the country was split and their, their family had to leave. And what I'm told is a, a palace where they lived in uh, Amritsar in the Punjab, where they had, I think, 23 servants, is, is what we're told. And uh, there's a fascinating story about having to leave all that behind and start afresh in in a, a new place and that was closer to the border of Afghanistan in a place called Peshawar um so my dad was there until he was I think he was 2021 20, and then he then decided he he wanted to go to America to become a photojournalist and he left with one dollar in his pocket because mm. that's all you're allowed to take um and traveled by boat and uh, made his way to the Middle East and then to England. And his plan was to earn some money to get a uh, another boat to America, but uh, never happened. I think he fell in love and uh, <laughs> made his roots in England. So let's just talk about kind of how all these influences formed together in terms of what you did for a career. You ended up, from what I understand, going to medicine. So... How did all that happen? Because it sounds like you weren't necessarily from a family of doctors or, you know, how did that happen that all these influences and uh, your own passions and desires, how did that lead to to medicine? Well, my my family are all very involved. Um, you know, in, England's a, a country which has a very strong history of, of social consciousness. Um, so, both my parents, my father had been a teacher with, with special needs students, and we also ran a, a, a newspaper in, as a family, a bilingual newspaper, which we all were involved oh. in. My mum, me, my brother were all involved in in helping helping create. Um, and then my mum was a social worker. She also trained as a nurse and a teacher, so she she always was working with you know in jobs which would impact on the community. Um, and then, yeah, my as I say, my grandfather was a priest, my uncle was a priest, and 
in my Pakistani side, there was a sort of uh, somebody who was a, a doctor and, and my dad's brother, but it was more, it was more about, um, about having a, having social responsibility and, you know, having mm. to, to live a life, which was of service. Um, and that was very much fed through. And when I was a child, I think I drew, drew a picture when I was seven years old of a, of a doctor flying over a jungle in a helicopter, hanging out on a rope with a stethoscope around his neck. Um, so oh. I had this idea, I don't know where I picked it up from, possibly my mother, but uh, that I wanted to be this sort of flying doctor who came in and, and uh, you know, made, had some impact. Um, Perhaps looking back on it, maybe the flying over a jungle in a helicopter was the bit which my soul was really pointing towards. But, <laughs> um, but no, I, I always had that that sense. I was very involved in politics growing up. Um, and then when I went to university, I studied medicine. I was still very politically active. And I also did a, another degree in tropical medicine and parasitology. Um, and again, that was all pointing towards um, working working. Yeah, you know, in in emergency medicine, in aid medicine, and you know, I never had any doubt that's what I was going to do. Why medicine versus a dozen other opportunities that you could have pursued? All of them probably pretty good opportunities, or you know, paths. Yeah, I I think I think part of it was probably ego. You know, I, I probably felt that mm. you know I I was quite um, you know I grew up in this you know we had state education we didn't you know have any private i mean there were there were private schools around but you know i just went through the state system um and you know i, I managed I was, I was fortunate enough to have a supportive family who kind of made sure i did my homework and you know i obviously had some natural aptitude um so i, th I think it was for me it was a combination of like I wanted to make a difference. This was something which was clear. It was a clear path to doing something. Obviously, my parents supported that that desire, um, but it wasn't like today where you have the internet and there were lots of options. I mean, right. growing up in a northern town, it was like you know, either you're going to be a plumber or a you know, a teacher or you're going to work in a shop. Or maybe you know, if you were lucky, you would go to university and you know, you may have you know some other, some other grander idea would i mean certainly being being a doctor seemed like a pretty impressive thing uh in the in the world that i i grew up with and for me it was very much about you know i i was brought up in a in a family which was a very uh a very strong strong family unit but I, you know, and I really wanted to to break away from that and be the master of my own fate. And mm -hmm. to me, it was just, well. There's several things. There was one that you know, it was clear you could become a doctor and then you could support yourself and you could make a difference directly. And this would lead to all these other opportunities of 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 within medicine. Hopefully, I'd be able to come and and go around the world and do some do some have some impact. But also, you know, within that. I think it was, you know, I was also like, oh, I can go to study for six years. And that's six years of, of traveling, you know, six summer vacations, and I can travel around the world for six years. Um, you know, and, and I didn't know where I was going to end up at, when I started. But when I first went to uh, London for one of my interviews, and I walked down the, the Strand in central London, suddenly my eyes were were really open to to the to to a big cosmopolitan capital city and you know sudden i think that really you know widened my horizons i mean and, and in combination with the travel i was starting to do throughout my late teens you know suddenly the world seemed a big place um and it was it was very you know in a way i was very very fortunate because being accepted to study in, in in as a doctor it meant you just knew you had a path which was there for you as long as you put the work in and you know um were able to 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 apply yourself that was a very you know in your early 20s it was a very 
clear direction and mm. you know you you when you, as you you know we were pretty hands on within you know on the third year fourth year we were there working you know training but also interacting with patients and you sort of you know you were aware of of uh, that that you you could what what you were doing mattered i think talk about just the whole that medical um side i think you worked as an orthopedic surgeon doctors without borders so just talk a bit about that whole uh journey that you that you took well we i i trained at king's college london and we we basically did two years of of very old school science we were the last year that did the real pure um you know biochemistry anatomy everything we know we did all the dissection of our own cadavers and all this stuff stuff mm. and i did a, a year as a training in this tropical medicine researching a parasite called leishmania so i was growing these little microscopic uh parasites in the lab in kensington and you know friday night i'd be coming out of the lab at midnight sort of smelling of full miles they hide and stuff um <laughs> that must have helped your love life a lot right <laughs> oh yeah that, it's what every every young woman wants is a man who smells the full miles they hide i tell you <laughs> yeah uh but, it, you know, but that's fun. I mean, I look back on those days, it was, seems another world. Um, and after I graduated, I was fortunate enough to get uh, my my two jobs working in the hospital where I trained. So I did a bit of respiratory medicine and a bit of general surgery with orthopedics. And it was at that after that stage where I, I where my path start, started to veer off, but I still continued for a few years of doing a little bit of, uh, of both working as a in, in the ER, mainly in the ER. I'd say that's kind of my, um, you know, it's it's a little grand of me to say I was a surgeon, but I was, you know, I was I was a, certainly a junior a junior member of the team there, and you know I did get to do a bit of operating a few times, but. Uh, you know, I was still very much a baby in the, in the in the profession. From what I understand, you were orthopedic surgeon, and um, you you know wanted to get an ER surgical job, but that didn't happen. I mean, that seemed like you know a, a big uh, change for you that maybe changed the course of your life. So, just talk about how that moment and how you know medicine was where you were spending your whole efforts in life, but yet that changed. How did that all happen? Well, for me, I, I applied, again, you're saying these these titles, they sound a lot grander than they, are, <laughs> they were. I mean, I was, <laughs> I, I was a young resident and I had been doing working in orthopedics. Um, and I applied for, for this wonderful job with a, under the, the auspices of this really, really brilliant professor called Professor Webster, who was an ex I'm not sure if he would still be a, be alive right now, but he was a a real character, um, a pioneer in his field. Really, I think he was part of that. Well, maybe yeah, but more part of the old school of intellectuals. He wrote a his own neuroanatomy book for us in. And it had like five languages in it. So he would annotate mm. stuff in Latin, German, French, and uh, probably, probably some other language, knowing him with <laughs> quotes from, uh, you know, literary legends. And of course, you know, we were part of the new breed of slightly less uh, esoteric doctors. So most people thought he was crazy, but I, I, I adored him. Anyway, he said to me that uh, he would give me this job in the ER department. Um, but not the one I wanted, not the one with the uh, extra anatomy demonstrating, um, which I'd be a teacher part time. But because that was for people who were basically way smarter than me and who'd, you know, come out of <laughs> Cambridge and Oxford, and, <laughs> you know. And uh, but he said, look, I'll give you this sort of slightly less, but still brilliant job um, working in the King's Casualty Department, which is one of the biggest in Europe and, you know, an incredible incredible institution so it was a great honor to be offered that job but he said i'll give it you in six months time because there's only six posts here and they're kind of all, already all gone so go and do something else for six months um go and explore a different aspect of medicine um because in england that's how they do it you you basically 
do six months in all different specialties until you've done every specialty and then you decide which one you're going to mm. to uh, focus it on and um it was at this point i'd been i had i had some friends who were musicians and uh, a friend who was a poet who who told me i should read this book called the artist's way and um i also had a friend who had been working in in new york in wall street who had just come back and he basically had said he just said to me I, I think you'd have a great time in new york i think you'd love it and uh for some reason i'd had this weird sense in my mind that i might be able to write or something and i decided that i was going to go for six months to new york and write something and and read this book called The Artist's Way, which I still, I have my <laughs> copy of here. This. There you go. Yeah. And uh, yeah, and it, so within within a week of this decision, I thought, well, I'm just going to go to New York. And I went there and started yeah, with, with no real plan other than this book and a backpack and... Um, started following this 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 course of creativity really um and this book called the artist's way written by julia cameron really is a guide to having a more creative life and you know through through doing that i find my, found myself within three weeks in an acting class and that really changed my life um you know my parents were were getting separated at the time. So I think, or they'd just been a couple of years separated and it was quite traumatic for, for everyone. And there was something about exploring uh, creativity, which was very therapeutic, um, you know, to go into an acting training. You know, I, I believe to to be a, a good actor, you, you know, well, that's not the only way to be honest, but but there is there is one school of thought that uh, is that you need to understand yourself in order to play other people, um, mm. and if you don't kind of resolve um, some of your own subconscious psychological issues, they're always going to leach out when you perform another character. You know, obviously, there's some actors who who that wildness or that angst you know informs all their characters and people make great careers out of it but uh in terms of of becoming a blank canvas to to explore other people yeah. you kind of need to get rid of the the scum from your own <laughs> from your own brain <laughs> yeah. make makes a lot of sense so it's fascinating here your professor professor webster said you know, you go through all these specialties, explore another medical specialty for six months, and you decided to take a different path. You didn't explore another medical specialty, you explored acting. There, there yeah. must have been, and I know from there, what I understand, you went on to Lambda, Lambda, the London Academy of Music and Dramatic Arts, and went on to acting. But that's a fascinating pivot point, because you'd focus on the helping professions and medicine and... um was there some like inner voice, still small voice, something deep within you uh, that was calling? I mean, it's it's a pretty big pivot. I mean, it's the kind of thing that I, in some families that say, "What the heck uh, are you doing, Darwin? You can get a it's a good profession, medicine, and you're going to do this acting thing, which is a lot more uncertain potentially." I mean, there's all sorts of streams and currents that you could have uh, had to deal with. So. Just talk about that. That that's a big change, a big pivot. And let me, so, yeah, please. Let me set it up before you go, Dar. Let me set it up in the context of this series called "Burn the Ships." And you didn't just burn the ships, man. You burned like a fleet from go, you know, <laughs> going from doctor, right, where you 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 done all of the you know people would say the hard work. You had your education. You said yourself that that next in your career would have been kind of learning how to do it. So some of the hard work was already done. That road had been covered to go into acting, which, you know, you don't start at the top there. You start at, at 
lower levels. So that was a that was an incredible burn the ships moment where you made that pivot. There had to be some really, I mean, that book really must have touched you. The people that you that you were with in New York must have really motivated you. But what led you to 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 strike the match and burn the medical ships and go into acting? So that that is a a remarkably strong pivot. How did you muster the strength to do that? Well, I mean, the, there's a good story, but too long to, to share here about actually how I found myself in my first acting class. But the experience was of being on stage for the first time with a very inspirational teacher. His name is Bruce Ornstein, who still teaches in New York today. Um, and there was just something about the moment of stepping on st on stage in this little classroom with 12 people watching and it was something that just resonated i just literally mm -hmm. from the I, I stood on stage i did this exercise for one minute which was called six characters in a minute and every 10 seconds he clapped his hands and i had to change character and i was awful i mean i, mean, I can't even imagine what it was like but the thrill of it was 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 incredible and also a lot of it was down probably to bruce's teaching because he really talked about your responsibility as an artist as as an actor to be paying attention to the world and to be you know and to be pay attention to what was around you because you have a responsibility to to kind of you know to be a a mirror to society in a way it was a very different way of thinking um, I'd never really, I mean, you say, I mean, it was, it, I know looking back, it sounds like a big change, but for me, it wasn't really, it wasn't really a choice. You know, I was like, I just knew I had to do this. I didn't even have a concept of making a career in it. I don't think that was even, uh, you know, certainly well, as a kid, I actually did a little bit of acting and I always really enjoyed it. And I think after I did change, I spoke to a very old friend from school and she said, you know, you always wanted to be an actor, but I had no <laughs> memory of that. Um, the idea that, you know, I remember when I got my first job some years later, it was, it was an extraordinary, extraordinary uh, realization. And again, you have pre mobile phones and pre internet it's not like you i had this desire to be i mean like it feels like anyone can become insta famous now and you know there's a mm -hmm. you know i i you know i was like probably like you guys i grew up and there was harrison ford and there was these you know john gilgood and there's these greats of right. of, of uh you know i, I got into theater a lot more as, a, as an older person but it was such a world away. I didn't, you know, I didn't imagine that it was something that, that I would be able to do, but I just knew that this I had to explore this, this, this experience of being an actor. And it wasn't about, it wasn't about, uh, um, uh, money. I mean, I, I, I just literally, the process of doing it was so fulfilling to me and it was such a, it was such a mysterious craft. I mean, medicine, you know, doctors do incredible jobs and, there's lots of very very smart people in that in that field, but it was very clear to me the steps you do to become. You know, it's a very clear profession. You need to do this. You need sure. to do this exam. You do this many jobs. You, you know, make sure you don't, you know, make any mistakes. And if all that goes <laughs> well, you'll end up. You know, it was very clear. Like the path to me was like, okay, well. I'd be 30 in my early thirties and I'd be, you know, the, you know, all being well, I'd be a consultant in a hospital as a surgeon. And then what? And then suddenly I was given that I was suddenly exposed to this, this world, which had rules, which I'd never understood. And there's people who, you know, who, who were not massively educated, who were brilliant. There were people who were super educated, who were brilliant. Um, you worked really hard and you were terrible. And it's like, what, what is this thing? <laughs> like, what is this, what is this sort of intangible, like sk skill and, and, and thing. And, you know, 
so, you know, you had this ability to to move people and be moved. And, you know, I was really, it was like a a coming of age and, and I was starting to really, really, fu- really work out what my identity was. Um, again, you know, I guess we still yeah. struggle with that all our lives, but it was the, it was an, it was a, it was a step of, of self exploration and self examination. And it was, it was thrilling because it was so against everything that I I had I had grown up like the structure of what I'd been around, and everyone thought I was crazy, and I probably was, I probably am. <laughs> yeah. but, oh, I, I I can imagine parents, family, they thought you're doing what? I mean, any family would, but you know what's fascinating to me about what you're saying, Darwin, is, and I think there are lessons really for all listeners. Is it felt like there was this inner voice. Now, some may think it's from a spiritual direction, uh, inner muse. You know, one can have theological, metaphysical, metaphysical discussions about where that comes from. But wherever it does, there was this inner voice. I felt like saying, you know, Darwin, this is what you were made for. You were made for acting. There's something about it that resonated to the depths of your soul. Nothing against the medical profession. And yet, from what your teacher was saying in New York, it felt like there was still a social consciousness part of acting. You, you know, it was just a different form of social consciousness. Is that fair? Like it felt like you'd found yeah. your inner calling, but you weren't abandoning your sense no. of trying to help humanity in some sense. No, definitely. I mean, it's it's obviously hard to unpick what is, you know, what is actually true and what is, you know, my justification for my life choices, you know. Um, I mean, I, I, what, what I do know is, is representation, and on screen is incredibly important. And, you know, I had an inkling of this when I was starting out, because I was one of a very small number of people of color entering the acting field, and. I didn't. I mean, I, you know, there was quite a there was quite a bit of of racism in medicine um, at the time, and that you know, being being mixed race and being kind of well spoken and sort of quite erudite, I was able to kind of negotiate it. But I I was very aware of of it around me, and I knew there was people, you know, there's glass ceilings, and there was, you know, there was there's definitely people getting different levels of care. And I realized that if I was going to stay in medicine, I would have to address that. Um, and then when I started being an actor, I was like, oh, this is great. We're all accepted and fantastic. We all have an equal choice. And of course, as you suddenly start getting a bit further down that road and you get your first audition, it's like, oh, well, it's to play a terrorist. And then you get your oh. second one, and it's like, oh, it's to play a terrorist. And then five years later, you're still being either forced, you know, mm. playing people. It started off with you know, being forced into arranged marriages, or it was, you know, terrorism. Oh. And you know that really did feed my my mission, really, which was, you know, of course, there's like the personal, you know, personal desires to actually go out and play play important roles. But also representation. I, I I didn't see any. I mean, there was two actors. There's Ben Kingsley. There was Omar Sharif. A couple of other other actors who mm-hmm. who were visible on the world stage. But I hadn't seen any heroic, you know, guys of people who look like me. And you know, as, as Islamic ter- terrorism was developing around the world with ISIS and, you know, there was some homegrown terrorism as well. You know, it was very clear to me that a lot of these people were reacting in part because they didn't feel part of society. They didn't feel represented. They didn't feel they were, they were linking onto, onto, you know, bad, let's just, you know, way, ways of being, um, because people were offering them some sort of sense of, of of self. And, you know, for me, I suddenly was like, I want to make a difference. I, I want to be out there and playing, playing characters where young kids who look like me or similar to me 
would be like, oh, I can be, I can be this. I could be, I could be a whatever it may be. And you know, one of the the great joys of my professional career was when I got to the chance to play Saint Peter, um, mm. because I was somebody who probably looked more similar than to Saint Peter than right. many other representations of him. And I, and I, you know. You know, I she was once in Singapore, and uh, I was taken to this Easter Easter service in this church, and they they played a whole uh, sort of montage of different biblical stories. And I was sitting there with with my friend, and uh, I looked up and I sort of saw myself playing Saint Peter on the screen there, <laughs> and I'm like, here I am in in uh, in sorry, I was in Taiwan, in Taiwan, and this whole society is now seeing St. Peter, you know, not sort of like a, a white Caucasian guy from, you know, America or England, but someone who actually looks, you know, like someone from, from the Middle East where he came from. Um, right. And I, you know, I, I just, you know, I've had, a, you know, over the years, many, many um, messages from people around the world who who really responded to to that, portrayal that character that story i was telling and you know on on some level i think you know that does make a change because people are associating someone of color with with someone who's a pious uh you know incredible apostle from the from the history of the church and i think that is really important for people to uh to change and to accept accept yeah different right. and you know and i think that that has become as a filmmaker now as well as an actor one of my my missions is about about diversity and telling stories which you know and i think the world is ca has caught up very very rapidly i mean the the landscape is very different now than it was 10 years ago or even five years ago um and you know i haven't necessarily been a a huge um part of that change but i've been part of that change you know there's been people like me who who've pushed those boundaries and 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 started to do that and i think that's part of the process part of the journey i have to jump back to saint peter cuz that's where we met um yeah. we met in los angeles uh, uh darwin when i was uh i was doing uh, film publicity uh, and you were in the bible mini series to this day the best selling mini series ever on dvd you were um, peter in that series and, and we were closely together um and uh yes you did indeed change the right you weren't some method actor from brooklyn who was jumping in playing um you know Peter, you were someone who had, who looked what that part was like, but you were also someone who really felt that part, who really, um, I was with you as you sort of dug into what it meant to, to, to play that part. And, and um, Warwick, it's funny, we talk on the show a lot. I give you grief about, hey, we've had 27 guests from Australia. Um, uh, Darwin is the second <laughs> guest we've had who's had dinner at my house. So <laughs> back when we were in LA, Darwin had dinner at my house. But there's a story, I, I bring that up only to tell this story because it, it gets to Darwin, not to embarrass you, but what a good actor you are. And that is, you may not even remember this. You, you came over with Sebastian Knapp who played the Apostle John. And I had had, I had a copy because Mark Burnett and Roma Downey, who produced the Bible series and made a movie of it called Son of God. And you hadn't seen it yet. I had a copy that we watched that movie afterwards. And while it was playing, I looked over at you and Sebastian. And both of you were on screen, but also in my living room. And you guys were moved by what you saw. And mm. I remember saying, these two guys are in that scene. Nothing is something they haven't seen that they haven't experienced before, but their, their performance moves them, which speaks to the power of the, of the story, but also the power of your acting. So not that oh. anyone can judge you. It was the right move to burn the ships. That's up to you to, <laughs> to uh, decide that. But the what you've contributed to the art form that you've taken, both 
in that that work in the Bible series ten years ago, and what you're doing now with the antiviral film project, um, society is indeed benefited by that. Oh well, thank you. I mean, yeah, um, it's very sweet of you to say. I think <laughs> you could say it's also with both egocentric actors seeing ourselves <laughs> in a movie. <laughs> no, but um, no, that is that is true. I mean, I think you know when you're playing a part of something which is you know um so important in the history of western culture and and you know so many people you know people around the world um you know obviously care and and lives are are shaped by, by some of these characters you know there is a responsibility to you know to to try and find a way of 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 of, of truth um to try and try and represent these 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 characters these people um as best you can and and it was a you know it was a very deep a deeply spiritual experience so talk about how that you moved into this latest project the antiviral film project which happened during covid and um that's sort of an amazing mission you talk about you know themes of separation connection emergence 24 short films 24 filmmakers 24 global communities so just talk about that vision uh because i have a feeling there's that's really part of your ethos of just trying to bring people together and tell just diverse stories from countries all over the world so that it feels a bit like a culmination of who darwin sure is and what you believe in to a degree would that would you say that I mean, I think so. It's, uh, you know, one of the things which is very frustrating as an actor is you have to wait for other people to give you a job. You know, <laughs> people do, you know, as a, as a painter, you can go into your room and paint, but it's, uh, you know, you can't, you can't sit, you know, sit around in your own room and just act by yourself. It's very much a community <laughs> and it's about, you know, it's, it's, you do need an audience, whether that be a camera or a, or a live audience. Um, and at a certain point, you know, I think you either give up as an actor, um, because you, you just, you get to an age where you, you know, you're supporting over a family or, you know, and you can, you can't do it just, you know, very few people are actually able to keep doing that or you, or you basically decide that you want to make the parts that you want to, you want to perform in, or you want to see, see out there. And I was in the process of doing that when the pandemic happened. And suddenly everything that I sort of spent the last three three years writing um, in order to try and get that made, suddenly the pandemic happened and I was like, well, that's not going to happen now. And it was really a, a sitting down in a bit of a panic, really, um, because a lot, of, a lot of our friends were just calling and like, what are we going to do? How are we going to, you know, all our means of survival are disappearing. Um, and when... You know, we don't know how long this is going to last, but when it does, there'll be a lot of you know famous, more experienced actors out there who will be taking up all the work. So we're probably not going to work for a couple of years. There's going to be people who who will d take jobs that wouldn't normally do because they haven't worked for a long time, um, and producers will be able to get a, a name to play a part which prior to the pandemic they wouldn't do. So, and so I just was thinking, like, how do how how does one create out of this situation when you can't leave your house? And what I realized was that for the first time in living history, the entire global population was facing in the same direction and facing the same challenges. So, what was happening to a mother in in the Gambia was the same experience as in Belarus, but just in a different context. Because and we we're all having to face this uncertainty. And it didn't matter what your socio-economic situation was. There was a, it's a great leveler. Um, so it was really about. To me, this provided an incredibly interesting backdrop, in order to tell stories because, we were all starting to connect with Zoom, um, but you know, and there's, there's that whole adage of you know six six degrees of separation. But we were now six feet separated, but we were less than six degrees connected. We were, you could be speaking to people, 
because everyone is at home, you know, we, we could call up somebody and say, look, I want to speak to this person, you know, and people who probably wouldn't have given you the time of day were like, well, I'm just here having a martini at home with my kids. <laughs> I'll give them 10 minutes to talk. So, <laughs> so, so what we decided was we could make these very, we could create, we could reach out to all our connections around the world and go to different countries and get work with writers to develop stories from their communities based on something that was actually happening um, or, a, or a, you know, a story which they'd been inspired to from something they'd experienced. And then we could get little micro, what we call satellite production teams in each country, and they would shoot this this little piece in sort of three to five days. So we'd be able to get around the having, because to shoot a feature film would never be possible because of COVID. If one person gets sick, the whole production closes down. But if you came and did it in three days with very small crews, you probably could get away with it. Um, that was our thoughts. And then what we'd be able to do is take all these stories and piece them together to create this cinematic journey around the world. So you would, each story would be, we'd create it so they linked in with each other visually and we'd have Easter eggs, which were in different stories. Um, so there would be links of characters, which were quite sort of, you know, spurious, but you, if you really paid attention, you'd be able to spot them. And what we do is we try and get this made. And, um, you know, little did we know that's, that was quite a, <laughs> quite a large undertaking, but we, we did manage to shoot our first film in Denmark and we created this beautiful story, uh, written and directed by a, a an, an actor turned director called Thomas Levin. And it's this incredible story of a neurodiverse child and his friendship with uh, a school janitor during lockdown. And then we went to, we then did a big fundraiser here in LA and we raised um, about $80,000 and we flew into, into South Africa onto a rhino reservation. And we shot this whole uh, anti in this conservation piece, this anti-poaching piece about the safety of rhinos and sort of women's empowerment story uh, in the Costa community. Um, and uh, yeah, we, we, we're just in the final stages of post-production on that. And, you know, we're hoping that these two stories will um, provide a great uh, example of what we can put together. And we have this whole bank of about 40 other stories which we can choose from, which we would love to make next. So we're now in the process, once we finish this, of uh, trying to raise financing so we can actually go out and make this in, in a more efficient manner. Wow. So as you think about the antiviral project, what's sort of your mission or what's sort of the vision of this is, you know, you, you know what's the why behind why you're doing this? What's the hope that What's the impact you hope that this will have on on people? The best way of dissolving boundaries is if you stop seeing other people as different. If you see difference as as not being other, but as just a another mm. reflection mm. of the mirror. And you know these stories are are all really beautiful, beautiful little tales of um, a family. You know, there's really universal themes. Um, you know, of people people want, wanting a better future for their families. People, you know, dealing with the modern world. You know, you know, we have stories about two boys who love soccer in the Gambia. We have a, a story about gang violence in South Africa. Um, from these gangs who've been fighting for thirty six years and they turn their their drug runs into ways of feeding the community during the pandemic. You know, we have you know stories which are about police violence in Romania against the Romani community. You know, we have uh, a, a love story set in Egypt in the trans community. And then you just suddenly realize this, the world is rich and we're all going through similar, mm -hmm. similar experiences. And, you know, I guess the, the, the mission behind it, the why is that, you know, we need to really start working together as, as a, a species and, you know, stop, stop. I mean, we're not going to stop fighting immediately, but you know we are stronger as one. I mean, that's what, I think that's a very simple thing, and there is nothing more profound than making a difference to another person. You know, if you can affect one person in your life, whether it be 
in your family or outside of it, that is the most nurturing thing. And it doesn't matter how many dollars you have in the bank. It's not going to ever touch that. You know, no, nobody goes to their, nobody has engraved on their, on their headstone. Here lies Joe Bloggs. He earned $5 million in his life. I mean, <laughs> I've never seen that. Yeah, that's a that's a point that Warwick has made uh, many times here on the show, um, and that sound that you heard, listener, was the captain turning on the fastened seatbelt sign, indicating that we're about to begin our descent to end this episode of Beyond the Crucible and our series Burn the Ships. Before we do that, though, I've got to throw a couple more things at my friend Darwin here. One, Darwin, you are the answer to a trivia question, as you well know, right? You are. Folks, if you if anybody ever asks you who was Daniel Craig's, what actor was Daniel Craig's first kill as James Bond in his <laughs> in his journey to double O status, the answer to that question is the actor Darwin Shaw. If you remember that scene <laughs> in the bat in the bathroom uh, in in Casino Royale, that was Darwin who was on the on the losing end of that. So that was a um, that's a good trivia question for you. And the second thing, my favorite role that you've ever done, Darwin, and I I say this as a man who has in his office four autographed pictures of actors: Al Pacino, Bruce Willis, Robert Duvall, and Darwin Shaw. Those are the only four actors <laughs> who I have autographed photos of in my office because you are you are a good. I'm, I'm still mad that you didn't get an Emmy nomination for the Bible. But I'll say oh, this, and you. then I'll kick it back to Warwick. My favorite acting role of yours was how generous you were with your time and your talents when I asked you to do uh, the narration for the, the the video for my wedding to my wife, Kelly, now almost seven years ago. And you knocked it out of the park, and like a true actor, you ad-libbed, which I loved, uh, <laughs> uh, which was fabulous. So thank you for that. Thank you for your friendship. Great thank pleasure. you for what you're doing. Thank you for what you're doing with the Antiviral Film Project and let people know quickly how they can find out more about it and help out on online. Yeah, I mean, you can you can follow us on any social media, um, the Antiviral Film Project, or just go to my Instagram at Darwinius. Um, we have a website, um, which is sixfeetfilms.com. Um, but if you use Google Antiviral Film Project, it'll all pop up there. Awesome. Warwick? As always, as host of the show, the last question is yours. Well, Darwin, thanks so much for being here and just your whole life and journey is so inspiring. Um, there may be listeners today, hopefully who are socially conscious that want to make the world a better place. Maybe they're just going down some profession because their mom, dad, parents, teachers said to go down this profession. And, and it's okay, but they feel like Maybe they were made for something more. Maybe there does need to be more, uh, you know, unity, uh, more maybe diversity of voices. So for those who might be listening that they have a social consciousness, perhaps they want to do good in the world, but they're just, I don't know, they're kind of just rolling along in life, not really taking control. What would a word of hope, encouragement, or perhaps exhortation you would have to listeners such as that? I mean, I'm not sure if I'm the right person to say this, but I, I certainly found that doing the artist's way and the and the morning pages, the journaling every morning, really helps you tune into your inner voice. And I think there's a lot of noise out there. You know, I suffer from it as much as anyone else. You know, the the day to day panic about how about financial security and surviving. Um, but I wouldn't give up, give it up for a steady job again, you know? Um, so I think it's about tuning into your inner voice and, you know, I find that, that process of, of journaling a really good way because you start to, you know, essentially it's, it's a process of, of sort of free writing of just like, just writing everything in your brain and down in the morning and you realize that a lot of the nonsense there is kind of stuff which just gets repeated and you suddenly go well if i just deal with that nonsense i'm going to open up a bigger space for for some of the things which i i was really important to me and you know whether that be an artistic pursuit or just something personal or or family 
um it's about really connecting in i mean i think meditation people have a great great success with that too but you know anything that that can you know if you can if you can hone in on what is truthful to you and follow that you i don't think you're ever gonna regret it you you might be like well i wish i had this or i had that but you can always come back to the fact that you making that decision and that was what your heart was telling you um and you know maybe it's naive i don't know <laughs> but um it's uh at least at least the buck stops with me you know i, I can't complain to anyone else about the state of my life you know Listeners, I've been in the communication business long enough to know when the last word has been spoken on an on an issue, and uh, we just heard the director yell "cut." That's that's the end of our episode, and on this episode of "Burn the Ships for Beyond the Crucible." And remember this: that if it feels like your ships have drifted off course a little bit, if as you as you're sailing along and you look on the horizon and you see things like Darwin's talking about that maybe appeal to you, bring your heart alive in a different way light a match. We'll see you next week. If you enjoyed this episode, learned something from it, we invite you to engage more deeply with those of us at Beyond the Crucible. Visit our website, beyondthecrucible.com, to explore a plethora of offerings to help you transform what's been broken into breakthrough. A great place to start? Our free online assessment, which will help you pinpoint where you are on your journey beyond your crucible and to chart a course forward. See you next week.